Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CATHIP Health Outcome. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating, and giving space to Black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our Black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members, and friends. Some weeks will vary, and will include other panel members, such as pharmacists, specialist nurses, and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell, and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious, and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you, and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences, and ask questions to our Black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our Black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Good morning, everyone. Um, lovely to see you on another Saturday morning. Um, and it's great to be here as always. So you are at Cathip's Health Hour, um, and today we have got something that I'm really quite excited about because we've got another fantastic colleague, a fantastic consultant, but we've also got someone of had, who's had lived experience, um, and I'll talk about that a bit later. But it's it's really powerful to have someone who personally understands the the topic that we're talking about. So I'll explain that, but. I just wanted to remind you all, you know, why we're here and why you're taking your Saturday morning to be with us. Um, and this health hour is really for you. So we've come together with, a, it's a targeted health improvement program with a number of organizations that are here to make sure that we can improve our understanding of health and really improve how we can empower ourselves and our loved ones to have more control of our health. And that partnership includes um, the Caribbean and African Health Network, the Black Health Initiative, the Royal Assembly Redeemed Christian Church of God, Rafa International Development Agency, Croydon BME Forum, and the Enfield Caribbean Association. And I just wanna take this time to thank all these organizations that make um, all these health hours possible. But as I said, this um, health hour is for you. And so it's an opportunity for you to engage, to ask questions. So please do write your questions in the chat as you go along. Um, don't wait until the end, because often we forget our questions. So as, we're, as you're listening to the speakers, feel free to put the questions in the chat. And we'll all be working together behind the scenes to make sure that we put all the questions together to um, our guests. And what we'd love to know is where are you? Where are you listening from? Are you listening by yourself? Are you listening with friends and family? Are you um, listening while you're um, cooking, cleaning? You know, that's what we want to know. So please do feel free to put that in the chat as well. And just to remind you all that we are recording this session. It is live um, and we'll be sharing the details after of if you've uh, friends and family have missed it, please do share the link. But today, um, as I said, I am really excited because we're talking about the topic of childhood diabetes um, and thinking of, you know, are you a child with diabetes or are you a parent or carer of a child living with diabetes? Um, and I think this is such an important perspective because often um, some of the biggest challenges in our lives are not only whether we're affected by something personally, but how do we care for our loved ones um, if they are affected by something? And also particularly it, when someone is young in their childhood, how do you support them as they go into adulthood? 
So we have got a fantastic um, consultant, Dr. Chizo Agru, who is a consultant pediatrician in diabetes and endocrinology. And she will be kindly taking us through um, to learn about it, how to recognize symptoms and how to promote a healthy lifestyle. But also, as I said, that we have um, a someone who's had lived experience, Daniel, who was diagnosed at age 10, and he is also be going to be giving his perspective. And I think that this format of someone giving the medical background and someone talking from their own perspective is um, something that we've been nurturing at Cathit, um, and I really hope that we'll be doing more. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Agu to take us forward, and then afterwards um, I will hand you over to Daniel. So. Dr. Agu, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll just share my slides. Lovely. Um, can you see my slides now? Yeah, and full screens. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. So what I'm going to be talking about today, I'll explain what diabetes is from a um, children's perspective. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about type 1 diabetes and then type 2 diabetes. That, that's the outline um, of my talk today. So diabetes is, as we all know, is a lifelong condition that causes a person's blood sugar to be very high. Now, for children, there are many types of diabetes, um, but the two commonest ones that I'll focus on is type 1 and type 2. So what do we mean by type 1? So type 1 in children occurs when for some reason, their body's immune system, which is supposed to help them fight um, infections and other things, destroys the bit of the pancreas that produces insulin so that the child now lacks insulin, the child doesn't make insulin. And this is very different um, from type 2 diabetes. So in children, type 2 diabetes occurs when the amount of insulin that they're producing is not adequate because the body is not reacting to the insulin. So the body is resistant to the effect of the insulin. And this tends to happen, especially if the child is overweight or obese. So they still then present with the same symptoms and signs as somebody who lacks insulin. I'll explain this in a bit more detail. So I'll focus on type one for now. So, when we talk about diabetes, um, a simple way of trying to explain it is if you think about it, when we eat food, the food is broken down in our body and is converted into glucose. Then the glucose moves from the digestive tract, from your gut into your bloodstream. And what then happens is that the pancreas, the bit of the pancreas produces this substance called insulin. The reason is because the glucose, you need all the organs of the body need glucose for energy. So what insulin does is that insulin is like the key that opens up the channels of the organs so that the glucose moves from the blood to the organs of the body so that all the organs of the body have energy to work. So when you have diabetes and you're not making insulin, what happens is you eat food, the food is broken down into glucose, the glucose stays in your blood because you don't have the key that will open up the channel so that it moves into the organs. So the organs of the body no longer have um, energy to work and your blood glucose stays high. And that's how you get the symptoms and the complications of diabetes. So how common is it? Now, childhood diabetes is nowhere as common as adult diabetes. So most people wouldn't even know that children do get diabetes. But in this country, we have the fifth highest rate of childhood diabetes in the entire world. Finland has the highest for children up to 14 years. We have double that of um, France and Italy. And since COVID pandemic, we're seeing more and more children um, having diabetes. Now, the commonest type of diabetes children have is type 1 diabetes. This is different from adults where the commonest type of diabetes they have is type two diabetes. Now to put it in context, specialists like myself will be seeing mainly children with type one diabetes, but a general practitioner will only diagnose a child with type one, with any type of diabetes, maybe once every two years. So 
a general practitioner will not be seeing many children with diabetes. They'll be seeing more of adults with diabetes. So if you all have a child with diabetes, they need to be in specialist care. So with somebody who sees a lot of it. Now, the next question people tend to ask is, what caused child, childhood diabetes? What's made this child get diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is no one's fault. It's not because you fed them the wrong thing. It's not because you did something else. Now, there are a number of genes that are involved in type 1 diabetes. Those genes don't give you the diabetes, but they increase your chance of developing diabetes. Um, and this is why it can sometimes run in families, because if you if your family member has type 1 diabetes, then your chance of developing type 1 diabetes is high because if you have the same type of genes that give you increase your risk of developing diabetes, then it tends to be the combination of having this risk um, profile and something else, maybe viruses, that puts you at risk of developing diabetes. So like I said, for those who are at risk of developing diabetes, type 1 diabetes because they have the, um, the genes that puts them at risk, what happens is that their immune system then attacks the cells of their body that produce insulin. Now, these antibodies that mistakenly attack the cells can be detected by a blood test. And in fact, if you do a blood test for somebody at risk who is about four or five years old, you may be able to detect these antibodies years before they even develop the diabetes. So now by doing the test, we can tell somebody is most likely to develop this type one diabetes at some time in the future. So how will you recognize that somebody has diabetes or your child is the, the, has diabetes? Now, if you notice your child having increased thirst, they're constantly drinking or they increased hunger, they're very hungry, or the opposite, they've lost their appetite. The other thing is they wean a lot, frequent urination, they're waking up in the middle of the night in the daytime, you should ask your GP or your family doctor to test whether they have diabetes. Another sign is a child who has been dry suddenly starts wetting the bed. That can be, that can tell you that, oh, maybe they have developed diabetes or they lose weight and it's not clear why they've lost weight and they're tired and lethargic and so on. Remember I said childhood diabetes is not very common for the family doctors to see. So if you have, if your child has any of these symptoms, when you go to your general practitioner, ask them the question, could it be diabetes? Because that would then put the thought in their mind so that they can then do the necessary te test to see whether it is um, or not. Now, children can also present very unwell um, in something we call diabetic ketoacidosis, which we call DKA for short. So this is where they are vomiting, they are tired, they have tummy pains, they're breathing fast, they look dehydrated. They can even lose consciousness. Some people can smell ketones, you know, the confusion. Now, this is an emergency. If you suspect your child has diabetes because they've been having all those symptoms I talked about and they get to this stage, you need to call the ambulance to take them to hospital because this is an emergency. People can die of diabetic ketoacidosis. So a child with diabetes or a child you suspect with diabetes who is vomiting, lethargic, breathing fast and so on needs to be seen immediately because they need to start on insulin straight away. So when, if your child has some of the symptoms that we talked about, um, all your family doctor or GP needs to do is just a finger prick blood test. They don't need to do any fancy tests. And if the glucose level is above 11.1, the child confirms the child has diabetes. So the symptoms I talked about with just a blood test that shows 11.1, um, then you, uh, the child has diabetes. We have had instances where um, the family doctors have ordered lots and lots of tests and that only delays it. And, and so the child can then present later on with um, DKA. We don't want that. 
the NICE guideline says all children suspected of having diabetes must be referred immediately on the same day by telephone because they need to be admitted and started on insulin straight away to stop them getting the DKA, the severe symptoms that we talked um, about. So we sometimes see cases where the diagnosis of um, diabetes in children are delayed. This is because, like I said, not many people are familiar with the symptoms. Um, and sometimes the symptoms in children can be nonspecific. Because bedwetting, you might think, oh, maybe because the child is stressed because of something else, that's why they started to bedwet. Or the fact that they're drinking loads might not strike you. So you just know your child is a little bit tired. So when you go to the GP, you might say, focus on the tiredness and not talk about the other symptoms. So it may not direct their mind towards diabetes. So knowing the symptoms is really important. It's really important because we don't really want children being rushed in in DKA. So remember, people think about them as the three T's. Excessive thirst, if they're, if they're excessive thirst, excessive hunger, excessive um, wean, um, like those are the three things that might make you think, wow, this child may have diabetes. I'm going to ask my family doctor just to check. Um, because if they're presenting DKA, then um, it means that they're really ill and they might need intensive care or high dependency care. And, and we don't want that if at all possible. So how do we look after children with diabetes, type one diabetes? For the families and the people with diabetes, it can be a constant feel like a juggle between insulin, food and exercise, monitoring their blood glucose, et cetera. Now, the key thing to remember is that diabetes in children is a serious con condition. But in fact, if we manage it well and the child has good control, we can significantly reduce the risk of complications. And in fact, Thanks to modern medicine, people living with diabetes today have an excellent chance of leading long, healthy lives, which is free of serious complications. So we need to think about if we're living with diabetes, how can we achieve good control so that we can live long, healthy lives free of complications? Diabetes is something you have to live with. So ultimately, the parents, the children are responsible for managing their diabetes. And so the more it's one of those conditions, the more you do, the better for you. So you, they need the knowledge and skills and support of healthcare professionals like ourselves. But ultimately, they are going to have to manage this diabetes themselves. Because if you put it into context, people have worked it out. If you think about the time you spend with your specialist doctor, your GP, the nurse, it, it, it amounts only to about six hours a year. The rest of the time, over 8,000 hours a year, you're living with yourself, going to school, going to college, and with your diabetes. So you have to have the knowledge to be able to live well and healthy, to be able to do all the things that you want to do. And there is nothing you cannot do as a child or a young person with diabetes. The, we have doctors, nurses with diabetes, the most acclaimed um, athlete that won the Olympic medal, Steve Beckley has diabetes. Uh, we have fashion models, anything with diabetes. You can be anything you want. You can climb mountains if you want with diabetes, but you just have to look after yourself to be able to achieve all of that. So there are many aspects of looking after diabetes. So um, the key is that they lack insulin, so they must have insulin. And there are different ways to give insulin. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you can have multiple injection therapy. So this is where the children have to inject before they eat um, a minimum of about four times a day. So they, have, they need both quick acting insulin and long acting insulin. But you can also give the insulin through an insulin pump. And nowadays we have artificial pancreas that make life a lot easier. And I'll talk a little bit about that because I want to encourage people, especially if you live in this country where you can access it free, to ask for artificial pancreas or insulin pump. 
healthy eating is really important. We, we will teach the families to match the insulin dose to the amount of carbohydrates they consume. And that is the knowledge they have to have. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And how you monitor your blood glucose, because your, we, you should try and keep your blood glucose between a target, which typically is between 3.9 to 7. You can monitor your blood glucose by doing fingerprint glucose monitoring. Uh, or you can do use a new technology, continuous glucose monitoring. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So just to show you some pictures. So this will be the traditional way where you prick your finger and you have a meter. But we now have all sorts of technology to monitor our glucose. So we have the Freestyle Libre where you wear the sensor and the sensor just monitors your glucose continuously. So you wear this for 14 days. Um, we have other sensors like your Descom that you can wear. Now, I will explain the difference because again, one of the things I want to encourage people is if you live in this country, you should be asking for this um, because one of the new NICE guidelines is that any child with diabetes can have access to the, all these new technologies. So what is the difference between doing your finger test um, monitoring or wearing a sensor? Um, an easy way to explain it is like using a camera and a video where the finger pick is like a camera. So you take a snap, you take check your finger and it gives you your glucose level at that point in time. So you just have that number at that point in time. Whereas the CGM or sensor is like a video. You wear the sensor and it's continuously measuring your tissue glucose continuously like a video playing. So you have up to 288 readings a day. So you can see what your glucose level is doing at any time of the day. And apart from just seeing what your glucose level is doing, it also tells you where your glucose is headed. It tells you whether your glucose is gonna rise or whether it's gonna fall. So you can take preventative action. So if it's telling you your glucose is going to fall and you have low glucose, then you might want to take something to try and stop you having low glucose. Now with social media, with the sensor, it's a bit like social media as well, because you can see the readings on your, on your phone, but you can have followers. So if, you're, if you have a child, you can set it up so you can see what their glucose is doing. So if you have a child in nursery and you're at work, you can just look at your phone and if they're wearing a sensor, and you can see what their glucose level is doing, and that would give you peace of mind as well. And we have a young person, one of the first one, he liked to go mountain um, bike. With the sensor, the parents felt um, easier to let him go because they could see what his sugars are doing. So just to analyze, just to explain it a little bit further, say you do a finger prick blood test, and um, this is your diary, and this gray bit is where your sugar is supposed to fall. Now, if you took this to your doctor, or you kept your diary, you think, okay, my sugars are doing well, except around um, six o'clock when they're high. And your doctor may well advise you on what changes to make to try and make um, your 6 p.m. blood sugar come into target. But if you were wearing a sensor that is measuring your glucose level all the time, and this is what you see. Can you see it's a little bit more complex? And the changes that your doctor has to make is a little bit more complex. And this might be the difference between you getting good control and not getting good control. So you were working with limited information before. Another example is, now we say your sugars are low if it's less than 3.9 or less than four. And when your sugars are low, you may feel a dizzy, you might feel hungry, or you might pass out. Um, so that's not something you want to do. So if your sugar is like 6.2 before you go to bed, and remember less than four is what we call hypo or low sugar, you might think, okay, my sugar is fine. I'm happy with that. But if you're wearing a sensor and your sugar is 6.2 and the sensor has two arrows pointing down telling you that your sugar is going to fall, and you're gonna go low in 20 minutes. That's information you wouldn't have had if you were just doing finger prick blood. So this is additional information because then you know, oh, I need to eat something to stop me getting hyper. So the, the reason I'm going through this is I'm trying to encourage 
more and more people to ask for this technology because our people are not getting this technology. Now, insulin pump, you can have you can have insulin through injection or you can wear a pump. So we have these pumps like this Omnipod pump, which is just um, like a pod, you wear it and you have something like a phone. When you want to eat, you tell this um, handset how much grams you want um, to eat and you press the button and it will deliver insulin. You do have to wear this and change it every three days. So instead of having four injections a day, it's like having an injection once every three days. There are ones that are tethered. Um, so this is another pump. These tend to be more sophisticated than these ones. But again, it's the same principle. Or we have the artificial pancreas. This is a situation where you are wearing the sensor I talked about, and you're also wearing your insulin pump. The sensor talks to the pump, so remember the sensor is measuring your blood glucose continuously. And so if it detects that your sugars are low, it will tell the pump not to give you insulin. So it can switch off insulin. And if it detects your sugars are high, it will tell the pump to give yourself a little bit more insulin. And this will help you keep your sugar in target. Um, but if you want to eat food, you have to tell the pump how much carbohydrates you want to eat and then press the button to give the right amount of insulin. There are so many different types of artificial pancreas. These are the commonest ones we have here. So these are the ways we look after children. Now, what is the experience here in UK? What I'm trying to show you is that we have national audits that show that your chances as a child of having an insulin pump, if you're a black child, you're 10 times less likely to be, to be wearing a sensor or to be um, having an insulin pump. And that's the same then, it translates into your diabetes control. And black children are having the worst diabetes control, control compared to other ethnic groups. So we're on a mission. We're on a mission to get as many of our black children to wear these technologies. You should be asking for the technologies. We, now, why is the why, why do we have this difference? I'm sure there are so many reasons. Um, sometimes they are offered and our families are saying, no, 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 I don't want to wear anything on my, I don't want my child to wear anything. I don't want people to know she's got diabetes and so on. Remember, if you have good control, then you don't end up with all these complications. The ultimate thing is to have good control. And we now know that these technologies help the children and young people to get good diabetes control and therefore help to ward off all these complications. So that's why I've gone into a little bit more details about what the benefits of these technologies are. Now, what do you expect in general from your specialist if your child has diabetes? You expect your specialist clinic to offer your child three monthly appointments where they monitor the child's growth and well being, as well as monitor their um, diabetes control. You expect your child to have a school care plan and that there should be school staff trained to supervise your child. It's part of legislation that if you have a child with diabetes, there should be people trained in that school to administer the insulin to the school or if they're old enough to supervise them. You should expect to have an annual blood test that checks whether your child has um, other conditions that are associated with diabetes like thyroid problem or intolerance of gluten, which we call celiac disease. You also expect that your child will have screening for complications as well as their mental health and well-being. And they should offer you a choice of all these different diabetes technologies um, that I've talked about. So these are the things you should expect from your specialist clinic. And if you're not getting it, you should ask questions. So once a year, it's changed to twice a year. If your child is over 12 years old, they should get their eyes checked to look for eye complications because diabetes remains one of the commonest causes of blindness. They should get a kidney check and that's a urine check. Um, they should have their feet examined. These are for those over the age of 12 years. All children, regardless of their age with diabetes, should have their cholesterol checked, their celiac checked, and their thyroid function checked once a year. 
And when we say good diabetes control, how, what do we mean? What we say is good control is there's a blood test that your specialist doctor will do once um, every three months. And that gives an average of what your glucose control, your child's glucose control has been for the previous three months. And what we're aiming for is for it to be less than 6.5% or 48 millimole per mole. Or if you're wearing one of these new technologies, your time in range, so the time that your glucose is between 3.9 and 10 should be more than 70%. That's what we're aiming for. But in fact, whatever percentage it is, any 5% increase is, um, has additional benefit. So if your time in range at the moment is 40%, well, you are on a journey. Um, and as long as you're making changes to try and improve that and you're aiming towards the target, that's good. And if you're doing finger prick blood tests um, or any other blood tests, before meals, we like your sugars to be between 3.9 and 7. Some people say 4 to 7 for ease. And after you've eaten, it should be less than 10 millimole. So when we talk about good diabetes control, this is what we mean. So I'm gonna pause type one diabetes and in the interest of time, we'll move on to childhood type two diabetes. Now type two diabetes in children is not um, as common. Only about 3% of children with diabetes will have type two diabetes unlike adults where it is the commonest type of diabetes, but the numbers are increasing. We do see it more in black and Asian children compared to Caucasian children. And if the child has some physical markers that suggest that the body does not react well to insulin, so some insulin resistance. So we see it more if your child is overweight or obese, and lack of exercise and eating the wrong things will put the child at risk of overweight and obese. But we also see it when there's a strong family history of type two diabetes. So where we have lots of family members with type two diabetes, we also see it. So I talked about physical markers of um, insulin resistance. So this is one of them, where you have this darkening, a leathery darkening around the neck, or around the armpit or axilla. So sometimes people think, oh, the child hasn't washed very well. No, 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 it has a big name. We call it acanthosis nigricans. So when you see a child with this, um, it means that they have insulin resistance and they may well develop diabetes. So these are the sorts of things the GP will see and then refer them to get screened to see if they have type two diabetes in the presence of overweight or obesity. Other physical markers is if the child has hypertension or they have the history of irregular periods, excess, being excessively hairy um, because they have polycystic ovarian syndrome or like I said, obesity. So these are the sorts of things your GP or family doctor might see and say, oh, I need to test this child to see if they have type two diabetes. How do we diagnose type two diabetes? Now, many children that we diagnose in this country, they don't actually have symptoms. Their parents have taken them to the GP or their family doctor or any doctor for something else. And the doctor has picked up, oh, this child is overweight and obese and has some of these physical markers that I talked about. And so they then test them to find out whether they have diabetes. But it's also possible for the child to have reached the stage where they then have symptoms. So they're presenting with excessive thirst, excessive urination, weight loss, et cetera, as well as some of these physical markers. So that's typically how children present with type two diabetes. Now, the thing to understand is type two diabetes, um, I said diabetes is a serious condition. But the rates of complication, if you're a child that develops type two diabetes is a lot worse than if you're a child that has type one diabetes or if you're an adult that has type two diabetes. Um, so the complications include, you know, eye complications, kidney complications, damage to your nerves, heart attacks, um, or sleep apnea where the child is snoring and sometimes stops breathing or even um, liver disease, they have, if you do a scan, you find they have fat devote, uh, um, deposited in their liver and they have abnormal liver tests. 
So it's really important um, to recognize that actually type two diabetes is a serious condition and that can be problematic because remember these children did not have any symptoms. They did not even come to the doctor to say, um, I have a problem. And now you're telling them they have this condition. And sometimes it's very difficult to then get across the message that this is serious. We need to take this seriously. And the way to look after a child with type two diabetes is intensive lifestyle intervention. They have to lose weight. And that can be done by reduction of the amount of carbs and um, calories they intake, and they have to increase their physical activity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Metformin is the first line um, of um, treatment that we give. So that tablet called metformin, um, it makes the um, body more sensitive to the insulin. Remember the children are insulin resistant. So it makes the body more sensitive to insulin. Um, but sometimes we do have to use insulin and all that um, injectables to treat the children. And when we get that control better, we might be able to take off um, injections. So it, it really depends at the level that the child comes to us. It is possible with type two diabetes um, to um, enter into remission. And what do I mean by that? This is where the blood sugar levels are below the range um, so that their blood sugar level becomes normal without them needing any um, medication. And for this to happen, this tends to happen when the child has lost weight and is now a healthy weight. But for children, you do need the guidance of the dietitian because children are growing, they need different minerals and so on for all their body function. So we don't just put the children on a diet, you need a dietitian to help the child to lose weight very safely. So that you know, all their calcium, all their vitamins, everything is also taken into account. So the prevention is always better than cure. And whether your child already has type two diabetes or your child doesn't, healthy eating is really important. Um, and this um, eat well plate gives an example of what our plate should look like when we're eating. So only 40% of our plate should have carbohydrates. And we've given examples of using our own foods like your plantain, your yam, um, whatever starch it is, only 40% of our plates should be that. And the rest, um, lots of vegetables and fruits and protein and a little bit of um, dairy product. You should check the label on packaged foods and choose foods that are low in fat, salt and sugar and eat really small amounts of these sorts of like patties and malt uh, vegetables try and cut those down as much as possible. And so I chose this plate because um, it will talk more to us and it reflects the kind of foods that we eat. For children, a breakfast is really important, a healthy breakfast. There is evidence that children that don't eat breakfast tend to snack a lot and then they end up more overweight and obese. Grill instead of fry. Now portion control is really important. Start meals with small serving. Let your child ask for more rather than heap it all on the plate and ask them to finish it. And make sure you use child sized plates so that they get used to eating small um, amounts. And remember the plate for only 40% should be carbs, the rest should be vegetable, fruits, um, protein, etc. Children need at least 60 minutes of physical activity a day for good health but it doesn't all have to be at once. So you need to think about how does your child get to school? Do they go on the bus or the car? If they do, you can stop like a kilometer or two before and then walk the rest of the way. Think about the hobbies that are active because if children develop these hobbies, then they're more likely to carry them up. You know, whether it's dance or football, swimming, karate, these are active hobbies. Um, and be mindful of the screen time. Um, we normally say no more than two hours of television a day. That's really hard um, at the most, you know, three or four hours, but no more than that. And make sure your child gets a good night's sleep. So to conclude, 
Type 1 diabetes is the commonest type of childhood diabetes. It is no one's fault. It happens because the immune system is attacking the insulin producing cells. It's also, if you have type 1 diabetes, you have a lifelong need for insulin. You cannot go into remission. So we talk about diabetes control. And with modern medicine, you can live a long and healthy lifestyle um, life. And um, I'd like to encourage you all to aim to get all these technologies that are available. But if you live in a place where you don't have access to technology, you can get excellent control with injections. Um, ask your doctor for four injections a day. We're doing um, a lot of outreach to a lot of African countries, Caribbean countries, and so on. Um, Type 2 diabetes also occurs in children. It's not as common as type 1 diabetes in children. It can be prevented by a healthy lifestyle. If your child already has type 2 diabetes, it's possible for them to go into remission with weight loss. But remember, diabetes is a serious condition, but with good control, one can significantly reduce the risk of complications. And even if you already have complications, by maintaining good control, you can stop it from deteriorating further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Agu. Um, that was fantastic. And I, we'll come back because I know that people, there are already questions there and um, other questions in other platforms, but um, it's the, the thing that really stands out for me is the number one about empowering ourselves and why it's so important that we have presentations like this so that we know the signs and that we actually go to our GPs and express our concerns and not be shy to do that. Um, but also, you know, I was just struck by the inequality of access to the technology and um, completely agree. It's something that we need to tackle. Um, if we've got something that can optimize, why not? Why do we not partake in it? So thank you so much. I know there's lots more questions that will be coming through, um, but I now want to just hand over to Daniel, who, as I said, um, has had lived experience of diabetes um, as a child. Um, and so, Daniel, over to you to give your perspective. And then when you finish, we'll go for questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just want to say a quick thank you to Khan and um, to inviting me to speak and thank you to the event sponsors as well. So hi everyone, I'm, I'm Daniel. I have been living with type 1 diabetes for over um, 26 years. Um, and as mentioned, I was diagnosed when I was 10, so you can work out how old I am. And it's all in the genes. Um, <laughs> um, and so, um, what I so what I'm just going to talk talk about today is kind of my lived experience living with type one diabetes. So, as I mentioned, I was diagnosed when I was ten. This was over the summer holidays, um, going from year five to year six. And as Chiza mentioned in her presentation, that um, one of the T's was first was was being thirsty. And so, what I vividly remember is I was at my nan's. And I was just drinking a lot, a lot of Ribena, but nobody in my family thought anything of it because it was the summer holidays, it was quite warm. Um, and then what happened from what I remember is that I was, I went to the cinema with my aunt and my cousins. I was ill that evening. And then my mum called the emergency GP and said, you need to take him to accident and emergency. Then I was later diagnosed with, um, I believe the doctor said diabetes, but it's obviously type one diabetes. Um, and then from there, it up until now, it's just been a really, I would say, up and down journey. So going back to school, primary school, the last year, year six was an adjustment. But where I really ran into challenges was when I was going into my teenage years um, and starting secondary school and that all being new and different. And like many teenagers, you just want to fit in. But when you have a condition like type 1 diabetes or diabetes, you have something there that's with you all the time. And actually your version of fitting in is, go is going to be different to other people's because you have this chronic illness with you. Every step that you take, it's it's always there. Um, and I really struggled with that. Um, and I think partly it was the nature of what type 1 diabetes is. And it is a relentless <clears throat> 
condition. Um, but also I think as well, this was back in the late nineties and things have changed now, but culturally we, I'm from a Caribbean background, but culturally in general, I don't think us as black people, we talk about health as much as we should. And so where you're dealing with a condition that we've already established today is very serious, but you're not talking about it. That as a young person builds up on you because you're dealing with everything that's going on, but you can't talk about it. And what that led to me doing up, I think I was about 16 or 17 is I, I experienced something called diabetes distress and diabetes burnout, where the management of the condition was just too much for me. So I said to myself, oh, do you know what? I'm not going to test my levels, but I'll take insulin to, to stay alive. And that's what I need to do. And I can fit in, I can be like everyone else and do what everyone else does. Um, and so that kind of progress, that's how it was for a number of, a number of years. And that's quite a key part of my whole kind of diabetes journey. And I'll, I'll, I'll get onto a bit later. I'll get later, I'll get on what, onto that why. Um, and so that's how I was managing it for a number of years. And, you know, 18, 19, 20, going out with my friends, drinking, doing, having fun, like other people my age were doing. But at the same time, I still had the type one diabetes there, but it was at the back of my mind because I didn't want to, I didn't want to manage it. I didn't want to accept that I was living with it. Um, and then things changed when I got into my, my, my twenties. Um, and that's where it kind of re I realized how serious type one diabetes is. Um, I reached a point of acceptance of living with the condition. But then also in the years, the years in my twenties onwards, it really got to the point of, I was um, diagnosed with chronic kidney disease in 2013, which is most likely a complication of type one diabetes. Um, and I received a, a kidney transplant in 2018. I also live in at the moment, living with diabetic retinopathy. So I've had multiple laser treatments in both eyes and I've had, it's called vitrectomy surgery in my right eye because I was having bleeds in that eye. Um, and why that's so important is because those complications link back, I believe to the times where I wasn't managing my type one diabetes as well as I could have been doing. And at that time I was just doing the best that I, I was doing what I thought was best, but actually what with, with particularly diabetes is, and it's links to what Chiza said, it's, it's kind of the compound decisions that you make. So decisions you make today will affect you in the future. And for me, with the complications, that's a very, very important part because I link back I, again, look back and I was like, I could have managed my type one diabetes better. However, where I am now, I'm in a much better place. And to make this all relevant to our conversation, I, I'm currently using um, technology. So I've got an insulin pump. Um, I don't know if, so I have a, sorry, I'm not sure if it's clear, but I've got an Omnipod insulin pump. So it's one of the patch pumps. Um, and I should disclose that I'm also a Freestyle Libre ambassador. So I have a Freestyle Libre 2 um, that I use. And this technology has helped me to um, improve my diabetes management greatly. And I can't talk, can't share enough how important it is for us as black people living with diabetes to go out and to get the technology that we're entitled to. And what was key for me is I worked at a type one diabetes charity and I'd never heard of the NICE guidelines. And I heard of these nice guidelines when I first started working there in 2013. And it was like, all of this information was hidden. And now I was just, I, I was, I, I now this, I found this new information and it's saying, this is what you're entitled to. This is what you need to get. This is, this is, this is the qualifying criteria. And up to, up to now that criteria has changed. Um, myself and Chiza are on the nice guideline update committee. And if you are, I know this is aimed at younger people, but also if you are an adult living with um, type one diabetes, you're entitled to um, say the Freestyle Libre 2 or um, a CGM. And the only qualifying criteria is that you are living with type one diabetes. And this is so important because 
we can go into, and I know I did, I go, you can go into conversations with a healthcare professional in those appointments and there's a power dynamic at play. And I know I was educated or not educated, but brought up in a way where you don't question the doctor. You don't fight for what you're entitled to. You just take what they're saying. But actually this criteria is there. If we go out and educate ourselves and we go into these appointments and we have, and we have the criteria there and we have these conversations, then we get what we, we get what we're entitled to. And if people say no, we go back again. Or there are um, organizations that can help. So for example, JDRF, um, there's a community engagement team, outreach team. If you've been told no, they can help you in terms of what you what you need to what you need to um, know to get access to this technology. Um, and I can't talk about enough how we need to just educate ourselves and go and get what we're we're entitled for entitled to and also part of my another part of my journey is where i've spoken about kind of type 1 um diabetes is that it on paper it's a very easy condition to manage you take insulin you manage your levels it's okay but it's also it's not just physical it's the mental and the emotional side too and again if we're in an environment where we can't talk about that then that's not going to help us as as individuals as well and that's something to 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 also um bear in mind and there is an online diabetes community out there there are people out there to 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 help and support and i'm part of the diabetes online community admittedly there aren't that many visual that you can see visually black people in the community but we are out there but also it's about accessing that community because there's information there and we can take what we need from the community and go and get the things that we're 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 entitled to as as well um and i as i said and there's kind of just linking back to what Chizo said in terms of the access to technology particularly for black children yes there are the systemic racism systemic challenges there but we do need to go out and get what we need to improve our own benefits. And it's about us, our own health. It's all about us, us as individuals. Um, and I can't um, emphasize that that enough. And I am I feel that I've kind of come full circle with not using technology, not knowing to what NICE guidelines are, to being part of the committee that's been helped to change NICE guidelines, and then actually using technology and I can speak openly about the benefit of, of it. And I know that people may not want to wear the technology and they may not want to do that. And I understand that. But my question to you would be, what is going to benefit you in the long longer term? Wearing technology or p being conscious of people knowing that you have a condition? Because these people will come and go, but the diabetes will be there. And if you know that something can improve your outcomes, then I would, it's a personal decision, but I would strongly push you to look at making sure that you have the technology that you need um, to, to improve your, 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 your diabetes management. And just finally to say, as much as I um, talk about um, complications, um, that me experience the complications, and as Chizo said as well, the technology and improving your management that has helped. And yes, I can't undo the past, but I can do what I can to um, improve, improve the future. And just one final bit is that another piece of work that I'm involved in and Chizo is involved in as well is um, the Tackling Health Inequalities Commission work with Diabetes UK. And this is really, really important because as a community, as I mentioned, we're not represented as well as we could be within the diabetes community but this is our opportunity to feed into this piece of work and to make changes and to bring our lived experience to this commission where there are people on this commission who come from our backgrounds who look like us and can bring it to to the fore as well and look at making changes so um if you, I'm sure it will be advertised on Calm, but if you see um, an advertisement to take part in the focus groups, please do that because we need, we need to, our voices need to be heard. Our lived experiences need to be, need to be heard. 
Um, and yeah, that, that's it from me. If you do want to get in contact with me, I'm on Instagram. Um, my handle is at T1D underscore Dan. But I've, geez, I hope I've covered um, enough. So thank you. Yes, but thanks, Dania. That's really powerful and empowering. I'll pass you over to Vanessa. No, um, echoing the thanks. That was absolutely amazing. And I, I think I just want to thank you for being um, so open and honest, um, because when we do share our lived experience, it is something that's obviously very personal to ourselves and we can choose the degree in which we're open. Um, and I think it's really clear that you've been so open and honest about um, your journey and also um the emphasis that you've talked about in terms of representation not just sharing but also being in the right spaces to share it for change um, and so the commissions that you're talking about the work that you're doing with um uh, uh Chizo, Chizo, sorry is so important because you know i sit on so many committees and you know there's only you, you, we, we, we you sit there and you, you you're you're lonely i'll put it in that's the word to use and you're thinking you wish there were more people that were there giving their opinion and showing there's nothing more powerful than sharing a lived experience because we can't assume that others will understand and when we're not there people assume for us um so um, just thank you so much. And I also want to highlight that one of the things that, um, you know, is great that we come together like this is that we have many colleagues on the line that are in a number of commissions really advocating for us in these policy spaces. Um, and I know that um, Dr. Faye Bruce is on the line um, and um, she is um, chairing the Diabetes Commission. And I know that um, Faye would be very happy for people to make contact with her as well. So I'm sure Khan colleagues will put I was lost, I think, but now I'm found. <laughs> so um, thank you. So thank you, Daniel, once again. And Chizo, thank you so much. Um, and now um, we have the pleasure of um, people on the line to share views, um, ask your questions. Um, so I, I would just say if others, anyone wants to start off the conversation, please raise your hand and ask any questions that you have. If people are quiet in terms of um, or thinking about um, direct before they directly speak, I'll just pick up on um, some of the questions that have come through the chat. Um, and I think one of the things was just about um, re-emphasizing the issue of um, uh, genetics. So someone j just says that, you know, um, can can a child have childhood diabetes, um, I think, and particularly referring to type one, but have no um, uh, history in their family? Um, yes, thank you. Um, the vast majority of children with type one diabetes don't actually have a family history. 90% don't have a family history. Um, only about 10% have a family history. Um, but even in, in, in the ones that don't have a family history, when you test them, you find that they do have those genes um, that put them at risk. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I think, oh, sorry, Daniel, do you want to? I was just going to say, I didn't have any family history of type one diabetes. I was the first one diagnosed in my family. Thank you. And, and, and I think, um, again, th that's why the discussion of just being aware of the symptoms is so important, because often we have no frame of reference. We're not, we've never, either we've never heard of it, or we can't really put all the symptoms together. So sharing um, this information is so possible, um, so important. Um, I think the the Freestyle Libra um, has come up quite a bit. Um, and I think, obviously, as Daniel has shared um, his use of it, and as you talked about it in one of the tools, but but um, would you mind explaining to some people again what the Freestyle Libra is? Because um, it's come up in one of the questions. Okay, so uh, Freestyle Libra is a type of sensor. There are many other sensors. There's Freestyle Libra, there's Descom, um, there is um, Kerling sensor. So essentially, instead of monitoring the sugar in the blood, it's monitoring the sugar in the tissue. So this is a sensor that you wear 
I mean, the, in terms of freestyle libre, wear for 14 days, other sensors you wear for 10 days, and is measuring your glucose level continuously, 24 hours a day, it's measuring your glucose level. Unlike where you do a finger prick blood test and you just do a finger prick and it tells you what it is. That's why I likened it to a video. So not only can you see your glucose level continuously, you can also get information about where your glucose is headed because it has these arrows. So it can say, okay, your glucose level is this number, like six. And if there's an arrow pointing up, it's telling you that your glucose level is going to be rising. And so you can take action to stop it rise further, or it can tell you your glucose level is falling and you can take action to stop it falling. And also you get the reading on um, either a reader or your smartphone and so on. So just looking at your smartphone, you can see in the terms of Freestyle Libre, if you want to see it, you scan or flash like this. When you make this movement, you look at it and it tells you the reading. In the terms of all the other sensors, you don't need to do any action. Or the newer Freestyle Libra, you don't need to do any action either. You, you can then just see exactly what your glucose levels are. And you can have followers. Your mom or dad can be connected to you. So whilst you're looking at your, read, your glucose level, they can see what it is. Your teachers can follow you. So everybody can see what your glucose level is. If you have it attached to a pump, um, you can have one of these artificial pancreas where it's attached to a pump and it can Bluetooth the information. It can send the information directly to your pump and advise your pump to say, no, this person doesn't need as much insulin. I'm gonna, don't give so much insulin. So it will cut off insulin. Or this person needs a little bit more insulin. So that's, so it's doing that work for you already. Do you see? Compared to if you were having to do everything manually. So if you're, if you're on injections, and you can get very good control on injections, it just takes a bit more dedication. Um, you're injecting four times a day and you're finger pricking yourself multiple times to get the same effect. Um, uh, can I just add with the Freestyle Libre 2 um, is the alarm, they have alarms as well. So they can alarm you when your um, glucose levels going out of your personalized range and uh, um, what I particularly like about the alarms is, is at night so something that I've struggled with for for many years it comes and it goes is just going to sleep and wondering if I have a hypo or my blood glucose level goes low during the night will I wake up and that's I think that's a worry that probably many people living with type 1 diabetes has and these alarms are extra they're kind of security for me as well so if it does go low during the night, my phone will alarm and I know that I need to treat my my um, my blood glucose level um, as well. And you obviously don't get that if you are using, say, finger pricking and you're just relying on your 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 own body to to make to make sure that you have your your hypo awareness there. No, thank you both. And I, I think, again, it's um, such a powerful um uh, advert for technology in terms of not having the whole pressure on you as an individual to measure everything and know that the times that you do you are anxious you're worried about um when you're sleeping what's happening that there is something there that can give you that reassurance and so not to just keep suffering or being anxious um unnecessarily so no thank you so much um and so, so often um, people bring their kind of personal um, experience in terms of um, medically. And so one person says, but what if a person always has um, readings above 10 every time before meals? Okay. So that's higher than we would like it. Um, so you would need to look at why that is the case. Um, is it because you need a little bit more insulin to bring it down? In fact, one of the key messages, if you have diabetes, is the target is key. It really is important that you, whatever you do, you try and get your glucose within target because that's what equates to good control. So if you're constantly above 10, it needs a, your treatment plan needs adjusting. It may be to do with the um, how you count the carbs, the foods that you're eating. It may be you need more insulin. 
it needs a diagnostic. So you need to sit down with your healthcare professional, the nurse or the doctor, to try and understand why your sugars are out of range and then to work out what you need to do to get them in range. So we, there's a sentence we have, we say, you need to be inflexible about the target, but flexible about how you get there. That's how you get really good control. Inf so the target we know leads to good control. So be, do what you can to get your sugars within the target. Ideally between 3.9 and seven, we can extend it to 10, but certainly not above 10, but how you get there will be very personalized. And that's the conversation you have with your healthcare professional to help you get there. Thank you so much. Um, and just, I wanted to pick up um, uh, with, with Daniel, you know, it was, again, as I said, um, thank you for being open and honest. And you talk about um, burnout um, and the difficulty of acceptance. Um, and, um, you know, something that really stood out for me is about the, the comment you made about compound decisions and, you know, decisions that we make at one point and how it influences now, but then, you know, we can still improve things in the future. So it's about looking forward and having that mindset and readjusting that mindset must, you know, it's a powerful shift in mindset to go from burnout to move it to positivity and just wanted to know what support you got um, and, you know, what support is out there. Um so it is it, yeah it's it does take a lot to go from that side to 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 where i am now um i think particularly when it was burnout my my key for me it was i need to take really small steps so if i set myself a target of testing my um i was finger pricking back then to so say if i wanted to do it four times a day but i only did it once that was a win um and taking little small wins here and there and just building the momentum for me was kind of what got me going. Um, a couple of things changed as well. So as I mentioned, when I started working at the diabetes charity, that had a real kind of impact for me. Um, and then I was when I was with um, my girlfriend at the time, just having her having wanting to take an interest in my my type my type one diabetes felt that I wasn't necessarily doing it alone as well, and so that kind of got the ball rolling with the type one diabetes side, and then with the complications, particularly the retinopathy, I I was I was just constantly thinking I'm going to go blind I'm going to go blind, and and it was more listening to. I, I quite like personal development. So I listen to podcasts and all these are not linked to so much to diabetes, but linked to mindset and actually learning to flip the mindset of, okay, well, maybe I could go blind one day, but here and now, what, what am I doing? And then just focus on that and then view the treatment as ways of improving my sight rather than saving it. Um, so there was that. And then with the chronic kidney disease, I joined a Facebook group about um, kidney transplants and I was expecting everyone to have diabetes in the group because for years I was told about complications and kidneys and transplants. And in my mind, it was just for everyone who has a kidney transplant lives with diabetes. And then when I went on the group, there were people who didn't have diabetes who needed transplants. And that really just, for some reason, just opened my mind and I was like, oh, okay, so people can have kidney transplants but it's not all linked to diabetes and I think that kind of had an impact and for many complications of diabetes it's diabetic retinopathy diabetic nep nep diabetic this diabetic whereas the chronic kidney disease was just chronic kidney disease mm. so in a way it also took away that the diabetes stigma attached to it um and there was not really, I didn't really go to any um, professional services for, for support. It was more having to do it on my, on my own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and I'm, I'm sure um, what you're saying resonates with a lot of people and not just with diabetes, as you say, is that mindset for many 
chronic conditions that you have to engage with um, each day. Um, uh, Chizo, do you want to come in? Yes, yes thank you. Um, so I just want to talk to what's available now. Um, diabetes, um, specialist diabetes clinics um, in this country, in UK, um, are mandated to have a psychologist as part of their team now. So things have changed. Um, the other thing is to say children and young people don't think the same as adults. So um, young children are not capable of abstract thoughts. So putting the fear of God into them doesn't work. So talking about um, blindness, all of that does, doesn't work. So we talk about what matters to them at that time. So think about what it is that matters to that young child. And young people think they are bulletproof as well. That's how their mind is wired. So if you talk about retinopathy, they'll think, well, it happens to that old person. You know, they think we're all decrepit and about to fall over. They can't imagine themselves, you know, at, at our age. In fact, one of my colleagues, one of the children asked her if she was alive in Victorian times. That will tell you the way, the way they think of us. So to think about long, talk about long-term complicated, it doesn't work. So you have to talk about what matters to them. Is it their football? Is it, you know, going to school? Is it, it might be the fact that their control isn't very good and it means that they're constantly going out to we all the time, you know, interrupting their play and so on. That might be what is important to them. Every minute they're excusing themselves to go and we. That's what might help them get the good control. And the other thing is young people are into technology. They understand following the, you know, so this technology speaks to young people. They get it more than um, the, their parents. So it's trying to connect with them. But we have found that using fear does not work. It pushes them the other way. And, and then they close up. They no longer speak to you. They come to clinic and they won't talk or they won't talk to their parents because all that you know all you're doing is nagging 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 about the numbers you have to have a way of creating trust with them and working out what's important to them but there is help all our teams now it takes a village actually in childhood diabetes you need your doctor your dietitian your psychologist um, and now we we have youth workers and social workers as part of our team um, to try and help motivate um, the young people can I say Thank you so jump much. in? Um, I agree with what Chizo just said there, particularly the whole scare tactics. They don't work, and that's what I experience. And you do shut off, and that does so mm -hmm. much damage in the long term. So completely agree um, with what Chizo said there. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, as ever, the questions are coming in thick and fast, and I'm very aware that we've got um, just five minutes. So I'm going to do like a... Uh, fire some questions and just get some at least people feel that I've managed to get through some of them but one of them was um I, I know that di um, obesity is accounting for the rise in type 2 diabetes in black children how do we ask for testing if our children are overweight and also um there was just a comment about the cultural diet guidance um for the eat well plate that you shared um Dr Chizzo um it was felt that it didn't appear very cultural. So just to get your points on that, what do you think? Thank you. Okay. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I think we are a diverse group. I'll start with the second one, isn't it? African Caribbean, we're, we're a very diverse group. Um, I was in Tanzania in September um, with a course and you know their food is so different from I'm Nigerian background, et cetera. So, we just have to try and push as much of our food as possible. And also even here, some of our children um, eat just Western food. So giving them a plate that has plantain and yams, they may never have heard about it. It has to be personalized and individualized. Um, and um, I think the more all of us contribute, the more we can try and make it as personal as possible. Um, Asking about how it's diagnosed, um, like I said, if you go to your GP and your child has the physical markers and is overweight and obese, you can ask the question, um, could my child have diabetes? Or if they have the symptoms, could my child have diabetes? Um, but ultimately, 
I think prevention with type 2 diabetes, prevention is better. And also, if your child already has diabetes, remission is possible. So it's never too late to start your journey with healthy eating um, and regular exercise. Um, so whenever, you know, there's a saying in Nigeria, whenever you wake up is your morning. <laughs> Whatever time you wake up is your morning. And, and, and this is true. So whenever you, you know, you, you, the message talks to you and you apply it, um, it will still be beneficial to you and your family. Yeah, Thank you, sorry, I was slow to mute, unmute. Thank you so much. Um, and um, just an, another question coming through um, is, if you're a new um, foster carer, so quite specific, or a foster adapter, and you begin, you've been given the child's health history, or, um, sorry, specific, let me rephrase that. It was, if you're a new foster carer or adapter, um, would you be given the child's health history or would you have to search this out for yourself when you register with the child's um, uh, GP? And I think that refers to because some children will already be receiving specialist care. As you said, that it may not be managed with their GP. So I think it's just any experience you've had with foster carers in this situation. Um, yes, yes, because it's so crucial that the foster carer knows what to do to help the child. Um, so in our setting, and it will be the same all over the UK, yes, it's absolutely crucial that the foster carer knows the child has diabetes. It's also absolutely crucial that the foster carer is trained in, you know, because if you're, if you're a young person, you might decide, actually, I no longer want to wear the sensor. I no longer want to inject myself. Somebody needs to be able to inject you when you're going through that phase. So there is no way, you know, You'll be negligent to put a child with diabetes with a foster carer that is not trained in supporting and managing the child. So that, that would be part of the package of care. Great, thank you. And then um, two very other quick questions. So one is, is there any long-term side effects of taking insulin in later life? So um, in, in type 1 diabetes, you're replacing what the person doesn't have. Um, so what you're doing is replacing what they don't have. So no, there, there isn't um, complication. Now, the insulins are getting better and better and better. Um, they used to be made out of pork and some people reacted to them and so on. Um, and now we have um, insulin analogs, we are, which are quick acting insulin. If you have too much insulin, you will go low. Um, and if you have too little, you will go high um, as a result. Um, and some of the sensors, um, you might react to wearing them. You know, some people get rashes to one sensor and you have to try another one, et cetera. Well, that's perfect. You've, you've, you've tied it up perfectly for me because one of the questions was um, just about sensor reactions. Um, and also one of them was, can the sensors be positioned under the skin if the person doesn't tolerate foreign objects on their body or, you know, just thinking of other options for people? Um, there are implantable sensors. They're not really common in this country. Um, so yes, they can be implanted, but they're not really common. We don't have anybody with implantable sensors in our service. And now, um, because we did get some funding to um, deal with health inequalities, and we now have over 90% of our children wearing sensors. The biggest issue is the reactions. Some children are allergic to, you know, it and react to it. And you, you try different things to try and, um, and help. Um, and for some children that works, but not 100%. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I think um, I have to come to the end of the questions because um, Sandra will um, tell me off if I overrun even more. Um, but I just want to say a huge thank you to you, Dr. Ugu, and to you, Daniel. It has been an absolutely fantastic session. And um, I know there's been so many positive messages, but also, again, the, the questions coming thick and fast is really reflective of how much um, people have enjoyed the session. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your knowledge. Thank you for your honesty. Really, really valued. Um, so thank you again. And um, I also want to take um, this time to just thank all of you that have been on the call. Um, we couldn't do it without you. And 
one of the things that before I hand over to Sandra is just to remind you that um, we're talking about health and obesity as well and what we can do for ourselves. And um, there is a weekly Healthy Heart session every Tuesday, which does discuss a number of issues about healthy diet, culturally relevant diets um, with an exercise session afterwards. So we really encourage you all to take part and there are um, details in the chat there. So um, just to say thank you so much and I'm just gonna hand over to Sandra to bring everything together, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chizo, for another fantastic and insightful session full of valuable information. And thank you, Dr. Vanessa, for hosting our health our sessions. It's always a delight to have you. Just a few announcements on our upcoming events. So next week, we'll, we will have another interesting and engaging discussion on reproductive health. This time it's on erectile dysfunction. It's same time next week between 11 to 12, 15 noon. So please invite your friends and families as we learn more about this topic. Another interesting program to tune into every Tuesday is our Healthy Hearts program. This program is focused on nutrition and healthy lifestyle, as well as a physical exercise session with our physical trainer. This Tuesday between the hours of 6 to 7.30 p.m., we'll be discussing nutrition and cancer, and this will be led by Mr. Letza, a registered dietitian. Please help us to reach our target of £20,000 by donating to our crowdfunding campaign. Funds raised will go to supporting people experiencing domestic violence and sexual abuse and struggling families through the cost of living crisis. To donate, kindly follow the link on your screen. Next slide, please. Our next family and advocacy session is on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Please join us as we discuss assessments themed, are social workers being intrusive or discreet? Our guest speaker is Nelly Azenwi, an experienced social worker. We would like you to save the dates on your screen about our upcoming flagship events this year. Our exciting International Women's Day event is fast approaching on the 8th of March. Please keep an eye on our website and social media channels for more details on time and venue. For sponsorship and partnership, please email us at info at can.org.uk. We have available in-house a culturally appropriate counseling service and family and advocacy service. We would like you to know that during tough times, you are not alone. So if you'd like to assess the service or know of anyone who needs some crucial support, then kindly give us a call or email us at help at can.org.uk. We would also like to invite interested persons to join our focus group discussions online or in person. Participants will be compensated at £25 for virtual sessions and more for in-person group, more for in-person focus groups. Please call our helpline on 077-10-022-382 if you would like to participate in these discussions. Next slide, please. We would like to say massive thanks to our partners for putting this wonderful program together. A big thank you goes to Enfield Caribbean Association, Rafa International Development Agency, the Royal Assembly Redeemed Christian Church of God, Croydon BME Forum, and Black Health Initiative. And we have their contact details on the screen. 
In closing, I would like to once again say a big thank you to Dr. Chizo and Dr. Vanessa for facilitate, facilitating this session, and also to Daniel Newman for sharing your story. From myself and the whole team at Khan, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again during the week. Do look after yourself and enjoy your weekend. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CATHIB Health Outlook. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating, and giving space to Black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our Black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members, and friends. Some weeks will vary, and we Will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses, and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell, and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious, and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you, and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences, and ask questions to our Black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our Black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund.